we have today Dr. Joe Barometti. Thank you. Today's speaker is Robert Hargraves. It's a blessing to be here. Today we have Kirk Sorensen. I'm very excited to be here at Google. Thorium is an element. It is slightly radioactive. It is a metal. It's got a very wide liquid range, some other interesting properties. Thorium is not really commercially used for anything of much these days. Nuclear fission is an incredibly dense source of energy. Nature gave us three options for fuel. The one on the top is what we use all the time. So what's the distinction between them? Well, it was discovered in context of a war. All of these were initially evaluated in terms of their destructive potential. Natural uranium, isolate that U-235 and they could make a bomb out of it, and that was Hiroshima. Take the remaining uranium, irradiate it, and you could make plutonium and you could make a bomb out of it. Now what about thorium? Could you irradiate that and make a bomb out of it? It's a really bad idea. But thorium's no good for nuclear weapons. You can take a little bit of thorium, put it in a normal reactor, you get some benefits out of it. But it's not an end-all. It doesn't extract all the energy out of that thorium, and it doesn't mitigate all the problems you have with today's nuclear power. Here's what happens in today's light water reactor. You start off with about 250 tons of uranium. Some of it's enriched. You know, about as many fission products come out as products go in. Most of the stuff that comes out is U-238. It's not burned up. But there's about a ton of fission products and about 0.3 tons of plutonium that come out of a typical gigawatt plant. A thorium reactor, it only uses a ton of thorium because we burn all of it. And out of this thing, we get about 0.0001 ton. We get about 100 grams of plutonium. Thorium-232 has a much lower atomic mass than does uranium-238. And in order to make plutonium, you need many, many more neutron absorptions successively. So the probability of making plutonium in that kind of reactor is much, much less. Uranium and thorium together, they both have the same energy density if you fission them all up. The real advantage is the ability to fission up the thorium all the way in a thermal reactor. Look at the uranium cycle compared to the thorium cycle. You start out with a whole lot more mining with the uh, uranium cycle. You have a whole lot of yellow cake that you make, but then you got to enrich that and then make these pellets. It's a very expensive process. You end up with a whole bunch of depleted uranium. You need a very big plant with a vessel that can hold up all the steam or any explosion that can happen here because it's very high pressure, and you produce a whole lot of spent fuel, and you need yucca mounted for 10,000 years. The uh, thorium cycle, you need one ton. This is for the same amount of energy, one gigawatt uh, for one year. Much smaller plant, low pressure. Bratons are much smaller, much more efficient. But the big deal here is that in 10 years, most of that, 83%, is going to be back down to safe background levels. And the remainder only needs 300 years for storage, which you can imagine finding in many places around the world that can handle that. And you can imagine making storage vessels that can last 300 years. Weinberg called it burning the rocks. You could literally mine rock just for its energy content. The average crust of the earth, a cubic meter has about 12 grams of thorium in it. And that would be enough to power your life for about 10 to 15 years. We have 3,000 tons in storage owned by the United States government that were isolated during the Manhattan Project, and certainly at least 400,000 tons more of reserve in the United States today. So it's plentiful. They had this program to build an aircraft reactor, and most of them thought it was pretty hokey. They didn't think it was a good idea. In fact, Alvin Weinberg, who ran the lab, said, it wasn't like we all of a sudden believed that nuclear airplanes were a good idea. It was the only way we could keep building reactors. A high temperature reactor could be useful for other purposes, even if it never propelled an airplane. Boy, it was super hard. You can only imagine if you're flying a nuclear bomber over Siberia and you run the reactor too hard and the engineer comes back and says, Captain, we're going to have to shut down for uh, nine hours because the uh, xenon's overriding our reactivity control. I'll just put down right here on the snowfields of Siberia and wait for my xenon to uh, decay away. They learned really quick. They're like, man, we have got to have a reactor that does not have this problem. Hey, what about a fluoride? Fluorides are salt. Salts are really, really chemically stable. Because they're so darn happy being what they are, they can go to really high temperatures, and they don't have to have high pressures. This was the birth of the liquid fluoride reactors to say, can we dissolve uranium and thorium into salts? Well, it turns out, yeah, you can. It's really easy, in fact. So they built this guy, the aircraft reactor experiment. This was the first liquid fluoride reactor. This thing ran for about 100 hours at some of the highest temperatures ever achieved by a nuclear reactor. And what's even cooler about it was it did it at atmospheric pressure. This wasn't some big high-pressure reactor. So this is what the molten salt reactor experiment looked like. It was a bunch of graphite fuel elements in that tank, and then they would flow the fluoride fuel through it. And they ran this reactor for about five years, from 1965 to 1969. And during that time, they demonstrated a lot of the features that we would want ultimately in lifter. Online refueling, they did it. When they wanted to take out the uranium, they used fluorination. And they had this fantastic safety feature. It's called the free 
freeze plug because the fuel is so hot if you cool it down it will freeze and it will lock up in the pipe and so they had a little blower over a flattened section of pipe and it kept part of the salt just frozen right there in the pipe if you lost all power to the reactor if you turned all the lights off all the juice off that freeze plug would melt and the salt would drain out into a drain tank that was passively cooled in most reactors you have to take the coolant to the reactor in an emergency situation and that makes them hard to build because you've got to have the regular core be able to run and make power 99.9% of the time but then in an emergency case you've got to be able to get the emergency coolant in and override everything else you've designed for all the other times these guys on Friday afternoon they just go and they turn off all the power and the salt plug would freeze the thing would drain into the tanks it would freeze up over the weekend they'd come back on Monday they'd turn the heaters on they'd pump it out of the tanks back up into the core so I mean they did this over and over and over again a working example is where stacks of documents and theory how do you know this works well they did it it really worked <laughs> Alvin Weinberg invented the light water reactor he holds the patent on that design that is so prevalent in the world today he knew its capabilities and its limitations he felt like this was a better approach there was a congressman who ran the uh, Joint Commission on Atomic Energy Chet Holifield they were having a conversation he and Milton Alvin congressman Holifield got exasperated and said Alvin if you are so concerned about the safety of reactors I think it may be time for you to leave nuclear energy Alvin Weinberg got fired he would called nuclear energy a Faustian bargain and he promoted the molten salt breeders the program was canceled in 1974 a bunch of Oak Ridge guys did try to kind of keep the torch burning probably into the 80s but I've met with some of the old timers there's really almost nobody there now who was involved in this the vast majority of them are dead there's no reason why any reasonable sized country couldn't go and make this happen quite successfully within their national resources it's a low fuel price low capital costs long life low maintenance you've got homogeneous mixing which means you don't have any hot spots which is a real concern in conventional reactors one spot gets hotter and it continues to get hotter until you have a meltdown you get to burn up all the fuel because it's constantly being moved around in the reactor and no fuel shutdowns because you can fuel this continuously. The cost of this whole system would be significantly less than existing nuclear power plants. We've got spent nuclear fuel accumulating from our nuclear reactors. This is the amount of spent nuclear fuel we have. It's not going to be long before our rate of generation of spent nuclear fuel is going to have yucca pretty full. If we start building more light water reactors, then we're going to hit those limits a lot sooner. Our current approach to nuclear reprocessing is based on dissolving nuclear fuel in nitric acid, and it's a very complicated, expensive process. Now, the French have really mastered this. I mean, they have a facility at La Hague where they do this, but it's a big facility, and they spend a lot of money to make this work. We know it's possible, but it's difficult. Now, on the other hand, the reprocessing of the uh, fluoride reactor is really simple. We just fluorinate the blanket and we introduce it into the core. So this is a complete nuclear fuel cycle boiled down to just a handful of steps. This should scale up as well as scale down onto the back of a semi-trailer. If you really want to use other processes, one is mobile, it can go to a site for shale oil extraction, couples very well with desalinization for water processes, hydrogen production as well because of the high temperature nature of the reactor. Core. One of the basic problems is this stuff is completely different than what they do in the nuclear world today. A few weeks ago, I was at the American Nuclear Society Conference, and I mean, this is like the nexus of all of your best and brightest engineers in the field. Nobody knows about this stuff, and, and I don't mean that in a disparaging way. These are very, very smart people. I've almost finished my master's degree in nuclear engineering. In that time, I had one course that talked about breeding, and during that course, about 10 minutes of it talked about thorium, and during that 10 minutes, none of it mentioned fluoride reactors. So it's entirely possible to go to nuclear engineering school and get a PhD and have never been exposed to any of this stuff. Then when you do go get in the field and you learn how to run real reactors and solid core and you learn how to control control rods and feed water and all this other kind of stuff, it's like the difference between a typewriter and a word processor. You'll get the same thing in the end, but what's under the hood is just utterly and completely different. So I think the real nuclear industry looks at this and they go, well, what are we going to do with it? We're, we'd be starting from scratch. It's great for an entrepreneur. It's rough for the legacy folks who would want to get into this. A lot of times back in the 60s, reactor vendors would sell reactors at a slight loss in order to lock in a long-term fuel fabrication contract, the razor blades approach. The whole cost structure around today's nuclear is really not amenable to this cheap, simple, easy to process fuel. We know that to tackle our global warming concerns, we're going to have to go after number one coal, and number two, transportation. Between this and electric cars, we could make a big difference. As an engineer, I can look at this and go, there are really tangible, easy to do, already been demonstrated steps based on well understood chemistry that's been around 100 years that we can go and do it and make this happen. This isn't that hard. In conclusion, this gives us options for inherently safe, proliferation resistant, economic nuclear power that can last thousands, if not millions of years. This really could be the silver bullet that enables us to power our industrial society. And this also offers real options for solving the long term issues 
surrounding our existing spent nuclear fuel and ultimately preventing the formation of new transuranic waste. And finally, I want to thank Google. I love Gmail and I love your search engine and almost all the stuff I've done on this has been thanks to Google. And thank you for having me today.